<laughs> wow. I know. It makes me nervous. These people, these people might know me. That's kind of scary. So uh, good morning, and uh, can't get much better than Chick-fil-A and donuts, right? So um, to, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, I will get started uh, kind of on a personal level. I want to share a little bit with you about me. So I figure if we're going to spend an hour and a half together, uh, you may as well know who's, who's running their mouth up here, right? So um, I am married. I've been married to uh, my wife for 24 years. Uh, the best thing that's ever happened to me. And um, we have two daughters that are both at LSU. Uh, I have a, one's a graduating this year in business management and the other one is a sophomore. So uh, also have two female basset hounds and a female cat. And the majority of our staff at Next Level is female, so it makes me very comfortable that the majority of the people in this room today are females, because I'm surrounded by females my, my entire life. Um, been living in Ascension Parish since it was a bunch of cow pastures. I moved here 24 years ago. Uh, my wife and I live in our, the first home that we bought and um, put two kids through private school and, and never got to upsize, so we don't have to downsize. So, but we've been proud residents of Ascension Parish for 24 years. Um, we started this company called Next Level Solutions back in 2013. Uh, originally, there were three partners. Uh, the original uh, three of us, I'm the only one left. The other two, both great guys, great hearts, but they, we went our separate ways. And uh, so I've been, we've now been doing this for about six and a half years. Uh, I have been in this kind of, uh, well, I've been in the business world for a long time, but as, as kind of an independent contract CFO consultant type role for about 10 years. And um, about six and a half years ago, we decided if we want to do this, we're, we better start building a brand and, and making a real company out of it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So I have a ministry background. Um, I am a former youth pastor, and I, um, I, am a, I play in a worship band. I play the guitar, and I'm a third string worship leader. So like when the two good ones get sick, they let me stand up there. <laughs> and do that. So uh, it's one of my, my life's great passions. I'm also actively involved in prison ministry at Angola um, for about the last six years, uh, specifically 10 guys on death row we've been working with for the last two and a half years, or the last about two years uh, has been an incredible journey. Um, and so the reason I mention that is because Really who I am and what I'm about is really kind of what, our, what drives our company's mission. And our company's mission statement is to, to help companies and help people and leave them better than we found them. So when I'm here today, I really, really, truly have a passion for, for you leaving here having something that you didn't have when you came. And I think if, when you talk to people on our team, you'll find that that, that common thread is there and, uh, and, and kind of goes throughout our team. So, about the presentation. This is not the equivalent of an accounting degree. I do not have an accounting degree. I have a degree in business management, okay? I'm not a CPA. So, uh, but I will tell you that I will match wits with any accountant, any CPA or any accounting professional on the mechanics of accounting and small businesses any day because I get it. And so I'm here to share that with you today. Hopefully some of the things that have clicked with me over the last several years being in business, I'm hoping to be able to explain some of that to you in a way that it clicks for you. So I want to encourage you. Uh, there's a lot of material here. I can't completely get away from talking about the theory and the debits and the credits, but, but the purpose of this is really for you to leave here understanding something. And so the second you want to raise your hand and ask a question, I want to encourage you to do that. If we don't make it through all of the material, those of you that are interested, I'll be happy to do a follow-up meeting somewhere or uh, a webinar. Remember, our mission is to help companies and help people. So uh, I truly do want to help you understand this material. You will find uh, handouts. 
that I've kind of designed to make, uh, to do two things, to engage you in the process, because as I'm talking, you get to fill in the blanks, and it's also to make it easier for note taking. So through the, throughout the presentation, anytime you see a, a word in bold letters, believe in making things simple, that's one of the answers. So <laughs> see bold letters, be looking to fill it in. If, uh, if you're like me, and uh, that's even too hard for you, all the answers are in the last two pages of the handout, <laughs> and it's, it's highlighted by section. So, um, so feel free to uh, ask questions and participate as we, as we go through this process. All right, why is this stuff important? I can't tell you how many small business owners that I have debated with over why their accounting is important. So I thought I would highlight, and I could literally talk all day about why it's important. I'm one of those people. But I'm going to highlight a few of the reasons why this stuff is worth taking the time to do properly. How many of you have ever made a decision without all the information and it was a real good decision? Okay, yeah, you, you, started, you started to raise your hand because you've made a decision without all the information and it's usually, um, it's usually not a good decision. So account, having the numbers and having this stuff accurate is how you actually make informed decisions. I can't tell you how many times I watch business owners that look at their financials and they're not correct. They're, they're making decisions with bad data because they just don't understand what they're looking at. So number one, it is what allows you to make informed decisions. Number two, and this is a bold statement, but it's true, proper accounting saves you tax dollars. If you don't understand the transactions you're making and the nature of those transactions and um, you, you, just, you just do things because somebody told you and you haven't taken the time to understand it for yourself and to be the hero of your own story, it's going to cost you money. It's either going to, you're either going to end up paying tax on dollars that should have been deductible or you're going to end up not paying tax on dollars you should have and later in an audit, if you ever get audited, you're looking at penalties and interest to an organization that has unlimited power to take your stuff if you don't pay them. So that's somebody we don't want in our life is the IRS, right? We want to keep them happy. Chris, I'm going to ask the first question. So sure. As complicated as our tax structure is, I mean, not just in Louisiana, but I mean, different sales tax collections that we have, a state and locals have potentially a different sales tax. I mean, it, it almost seems impossible to keep track of all that, depending on what parish you're doing business in. I mean, it could be Right. I mean, it's just, yeah, it seems daunting, but I guess if you can just kind of have those basics put in place. Then so the question is about, and I'm doing this for the camera, the question is about sales taxes and the complexity of all of the different tax structures and how can you possibly keep up with all that. And, and you're absolutely correct. I do this every day and every client I go into with sales taxes, for example, what are for resale? Where do we collect? What do we not collect on? It, it's ridiculous when, when, um, when you look at, at what you're expected to, to know and to administer. But what I'm talking about here is, is basically federal income tax. And so I'm not asking you to learn how the taxes are calculated, but what I am asking you to do is to learn how the dollars are accounted for so your tax professional can help you properly do your taxes. Uh, when it comes to sales taxes and property taxes, you need, a, you need a professional. And if you think it's expensive hiring a professional, wait until you hire an amateur. It's really expensive. So uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Um, so proper accounting provides a foundation for strategic planning. If you don't know your numbers, if you don't know what's happened and, you, and they're not accurate, how do you, how do you predict what's going to happen or how do you budget it's almost impossible you're just guessing you know you you're saying what you think is going to happen whereas if you if you have data to work from you can you can actually um, have a, a stronger foundation for strategic planning accurate data for government compliance once again the government has unlimited power to take your stuff if you don't pay if you don't do what you're supposed to do and, and so, yes, it is complicated. It's very complicated. 
just imagine how much of a mess you can get in if you don't even try to, to do things the right way. So, so uh, it kind of goes back to this saves tax dollars. The more effort you make to, uh, to do these things, the easier it is for you to comply with different government agencies. It's easier to complete the returns and so forth. Finally, and this is the, uh, this is the strongest statement of all of these. Working with a client right now who wants to sell their business. The first thing an investor does or a, or a potential acquirer does when they want to buy your business is they say, let me see your financial statements and your tax returns. They want to know, and, with, and the reason they say that is that they want to be able to see how much cash the entity that you've created can generate without you being there. They want to know, and, the, and to the degree that you can, your company can do that without you is the degree to which your value grows exponentially. So uh, without accurate financial statements, you're then trying to explain, well, we tried to, ex you know, we expensed a lot of personal stuff in there. And, and it, you know, if you're going to do that kind of stuff, then at least know how to track it so you can back it out and you can, you know, you, you can then prepare a set of financials that say, uh, you know, that say, look, these are our financials, but this is the work we've done to separate for you all of the things that are discretionary. It's a great word for stuff you spend money on and get the tax break. That's not really a business expense, but the discretionary stuff. And, uh, and that's, really, that's really what they're looking to do is they want to justify that value through those financial statements. So, uh, and this statement comes from working with several people that have been through this and gotten to that point and said, man, I wish I would have done a better job of doing this stuff. So it is, it is important. It's not nonsense. It's not just something for those other people to do for you. It's something that as a business owner, you should at least understand the basics about. So let's talk a little bit about small business and the economy. Now these are fascinating statistics. <clears throat> Over 99% of the 28.7 million firms in the United States, over 99% of them are small businesses. Now, that's a lot of small businesses. You, you would say, in fact, one of the videos on our, websites, on our website, I say that small businesses are 80% of the economy, and I said that because I truly believed it, but until I learned the facts that they're only 44% of the, the gross domestic product in the United States. So 99% of the companies produce only 44% of the GDP. The 1% produces 56%. Now of these, nine, of these uh, 99% small businesses, only 20% of those actually employ people. So that means we have a lot of, of you know, one person shows running around with an LLC. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you're not, you're, you're, you basically own your job at that point. You're not doing anything that create, that's creating value for someone to potentially acquire one day or to, or to pass on if the business revolves just around you. So this is a staggering statistic. And so what I would challenge you to think about is what happened if small businesses just stepped up their game a little bit? And, and I would also argue that this 1% they don't do this stuff, they don't budget and they don't watch dashboards and they don't take the time to do things accurately and precisely. They don't do it that way because they're the 1%. That's how they became the 1%. So uh, I would challenge you that <clears throat> if we all said, you know what, I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna start watching what I'm doing and I'm gonna really start trying to improve what, what kind of a impact would that have on the economy of the United States, of Ascension Parish, and so forth? So, now, we're going to talk about <clears throat> some, um, some principles in accounting. Because what I've learned, I remember when I took accounting in college, and I, I had the advantage. The reason this stuff stuck with me was because I was, I was in my mid-20s, and I, was, I went to college late. And I, was start, I had started my very first business, and I was taking accounting classes at night, and then I was going to work the next day in my business, and I was trying to set up my, my QuickBooks. I was trying to 
you know, buy assets and depreciate things. And, and it just clicked, you know, when you do, you just think about doing your homework for 24 hours straight every day for a year or two. That's what I, that's pretty much what I did. <clears throat> and that's why this stuff sticks with me. But, <clears throat> excuse me, there are, there are five, I think I have five of them here. There are some, some principles that I have found have, I've used continuously. So there's a lot of stuff that you're not going to get here, but these are ones that I have used a lot in my, in my career doing what I do, doing this stuff on a daily basis. So the first one is the going concern principle. <clears throat> Bold letters. In case y'all hadn't, I'm sure y'all already on that, right? Um, going concern. So what, what this says is that when we look at a set of financials or when we prepare a set of financial statements and we're doing our books, our, our thought process is that we are doing this for a business that is going to operate in perpetuity. It's going to continue to stay in business. I've had clients sit down with me before and we're looking at the financials and they really didn't understand it and they say, they say, well, like if I shut the doors down tomorrow, how much money would I have? <laughs> and I'm like, that's not how it works. That's not what these reports are for. This is a going concern. That is the principle. So this isn't something that you use a lot, but you just need to realize that in these financial statements that, you, that you're looking at, you're looking at it as if this, is, this company is going to operate in perpetuity. The second critical component, this one is extremely critical in accurate financial statements, is the entity principle. The entity principle says that Chris King's household is a different entity than Next Level Solutions or another LLC that I operate, King Technical Solutions. These are all separate companies. I have separate bank accounts. If I, it, now it doesn't mean that I can't do transactions in between those companies because anybody in this room that owns multiple companies will, will be able to tell you that's almost impossible to get away from, but there's a process to do that. You have to respect you have to respect how the money flows between companies and how you spend money between different entities. <clears throat> That's one people mess up all the time. The third one is the historical cost principle. So the historical cost principle says that in accounting, when we put things on financial statements, we're, we're putting them on the books or we're accounting for them at what they originally cost. So a good example of this is, let's say that um, this is a business and that, that, that operates here and this land was purchased for $10,000 20 years ago. And now it's worth a whole lot more than that. It's worth $150,000. It's on our books for 10 grand. That's, that's historical cost. So, um, so a lot of times I, that's something common that I run into. People look at financials and they say, well, yeah, but my, my that, that's worth more than that now, and it, it doesn't matter. That's not how accounting works. Uh, it would work, it would, that, that would go into the equation of a valuation if you went to sell your business. It would be a separate, you know, accounting for that. Yes? Does that mean for, like, equipment also? Not so, property? yeah, so the question is, does that count for equipment also? And yes, that's correct. If you buy a piece of equipment, Let's say you, you, uh, say you get a deal on a piece of equipment, it's worth $100,000, you buy it for 70. It's going on your books for 70. That, that's just one of the basic principles. But in the same way of accounting, wouldn't equipment have a tendency to depreciate as well? Correct. So the question is, does equipment have a tendency to, dep to depreciate? And yes, it does. And we're, we're actually going to talk about depreciation later. There are two types of depreciation. And we're going to talk about, uh, well, there are multiple types, but I'm going to talk about two that are going to make some sense. So hold that question about depreciation. So the fourth, the fourth principle is materiality. So I've been in lots of debates with people about how to do something and, you know, should we, we're trying to capture our cost a certain way, but it's going to take just tons of time to, to do something that really doesn't produce a material outcome. It doesn't produce an outcome that's going to have a material impact on the way the statements are viewed. So 
Um, there are the all of these things are correct, but if it's not material, it's okay to. It's it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's kind of like the the uh, trump card in a in a card game. You know, wait, I'm going to call materiality on that. We're not wasting our time to do all that because it's just not worth it. So that that's something that you have to understand and you have to know how to apply. And then finally. What I think is probably the most important out of all of these, and they're all important, but this one's really important, is the matching principle. So the matching principle says that if we really want to know what we're looking at with our financials, we want, to, we want our revenues that were generated in a specific period, we want to know that they were earned, you know, we want to record them when they were earned, and we want to match the expenses that went along with that revenue. So in other words, if I make a sale for a thousand dollar piece of equipment today and it get the, the revenue goes in October, but the bill for the, the, bill for the uh, cost of that equipment doesn't come in till November 5th and it's dated November 5th, the matching principle says, ah, if you wanna know, if you wanna know how, you know, what you really did, those gotta be in the same period. And there are ways to do that through accruals or for, you know, dating things a certain way or having your vendor redate the bill. I mean, there are a lot of ways to handle it. But the important, the important thing to know is that the principle is that they have to match. Uh, if you want to look at accurate financial statements. So on that note, I want to talk a little bit about cash basis versus accrual basis. How many of you have ever heard those two words in business, cash or accrual. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty common. So what cash basis says is that I don't care about the matching. I, I just, I'm gonna, when I write the check, you know, that's when I'm taking the expense. And when I make the deposit, that's when I'm booking the revenue. It has nothing to do with wh whether you earned it or not. A lot of people will, will um, do their books on a cash basis for tax reasons. They, you know, if you, if you have a large receivable at the end of the year and you're billing it under the accrual method, you're, you're booking that as revenue, which could increase your taxable income. But under the cash basis, you don't book those taxes until the money comes in. Now, I could argue uh, my businesses operate on the accrual basis, and I could argue all day long that I have just as much, I have actually more flexibility on an accrual basis than I do on a cash basis if you're trying to if you're trying to have things hit certain tax years. So just to, to cover the two, cash basis is, is uh, when revenues, ex revenues and expenses are recording is the cash physically moves. So when checks are written and deposits are made. On an accrual basis, revenues are recognized when they're earned not when I get paid. So if I do work for you today, when I, when I give them the bill for $20,000 today for speaking for an hour and a half, they're not gonna pay it right, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, exactly, I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> uh, but if I, if I were performing a service today and I invoiced, I would book the revenue now. They may not pay me for 60 days. They may never pay me actually if I invoiced them for that, but they, they wouldn't as a matter of fact. So, um, Expenses are recognized when they're incurred, not when they're paid. So that is the difference between cash and accrual. I would argue with you, I look at any business owner and I, I drive them to accrual basis accounting. You can always convert accrual books to tax, to a cash basis for, for tax purposes. Um, I, the reason that I do that is because that gives you the truest picture of, of whether or not you're making money is, uh, is a cruel basis. Chris, could you yes. Sure. So the question is, what is the, an she was asked, looking for an example of, of a cash business versus an accrual business. And it, the business type doesn't really matter. It's, it's really the accounting method. So, uh, and I happen to know her business because she's a client of ours. So if, um, if you were to, it, it's strictly an, an accounting practice. If you recognized your revenue when you deposited checks, that's, you're, you're recognizing that on a cash basis. 
if, uh, say for example, when I send you a bill, okay, I send you a bill for the month of, of October, let's say, now she pays her bills timely, but if you didn't pay your bills on time, I would book that revenue in October because I sent you a bill and I've earned that revenue. You may not pay me for 60 days. When the check comes in, it doesn't matter. It's not impacting my income statement. It's, it's impacting my balance sheet. Am I making sense to you here? So it's, it's entering things as they happened versus when the money actually moves. Does that make sense? Okay. So basic financial statements, and we're gonna actually cover two of these today. We're not gonna cover the third one. I'm gonna talk briefly about it, but we're gonna talk about the balance sheet. So the balance sheet, and this is, this is from class, this is from college. The balance sheet is a snapshot in time, and those words ring in my ears because it's not, uh, and the income statement covers a period of time, but that snapshot in time shows me what I owe, what I have, what I owe, and what's left over. But, but the important part about this slide is that it is a snapshot in time. It's as of a particular day. The income statement covers a period of time or activity. So, um, you know, I want to look at the month of March. I want to look at, you know, this week or however it is that you may want to look at it. It covers a period of time. Another word for the income statement, a synonym is the P&L or the profit and loss statement. So if you hear somebody using income statement, P&L, profit and loss, it's all the same thing. The third one that, um, that very few small business owners actually use, and I've worked with hundreds of them, and I don't have one that actually uses this statement, the statement of cash flows. And so I'll talk briefly about the statement of cash flows because it's a very interesting report, but it takes your beginning cash this is all, ba it's based off of the balance sheet. It takes your beginning cash and it looks at all of the changes in your assets and liabilities over a period of time. And it looks at your ending cash and it's, it's fascinating, but if you take your beginning cash and your ending cash, in each one of those balance sheet statements either increases or decreases cash. So if AR goes down, cash goes up. If AR goes up, cash goes down. It's fascinating how it works, but that's, that if you, if you do a cash flow statement, it will show you where your dollars went. Um, once again, not gonna cover it today because it's really not a basic thing. Most people, most, most small businesses don't use it. So the balance sheet, like I said, it's what you have, what you owe, and what's left over. Now, I'm not giving you the accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity, because that's going to just glaze you over unless it's, this stuff isn't Greek to you. But in very simple terms, what you have, what you owe, and what's left over. Now, we can make this very complicated. Um, we can talk about current assets and long-term assets and contra assets and liquid, receivables, and inventory, and all these different types of assets, but really what, what an asset is and what that section of the balance sheet is, is what you have. And then what you owe can also be very complicated or it can be very simple and what's left over. So if you owe more than you have, is that bad or good? It's bad, right? If you, if you have more than you owe, that's good. So what's interesting though about this equity section of the balance sheet, and this is something that I never learned in school, that I fi it finally clicked with me one day, is that the income statement or the P&L is really just an expansion of the equity section. So all of that income, all of that activity that happens on the income statement throughout, um, throughout the, uh, that, you know, the month or the year is either going to make you money or lose you money. And if you make money, what's left over gets to be bigger. And if you lose money, what's left over gets to be smaller. So it's really pretty intuitive. Um, but that, and, and when we get it, when we talk about debits and credits in a little bit, and yes, that's coming, uh, but I'm hoping to make it easy. 
when we talk about debits and credits, this, this makes a lot more sense of explaining. Like I never could understand why you, you debited an asset to increase it, but you credited revenue to increase it. So it was kind of counterintuitive to me. It's like, well, wait, they're both positive things. Like I'm selling something and I'm, I'm, I'm getting more of something. Why aren't they both debits? And the reason is that this what's left over section is, is a credit increases it just like it does what you owe. So in other words, this equals this, assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. There I, there I, I went and did it, I went and said it. Um, but the, the total of these two, and just think about it, it's common sense, right? You're, you, what you have and what's, what you owe and what's left over, what's left over and what you owe equals what you have. So um, anyway, we'll get into the debits and credits later. So if you have a question on that, hold it. Bring it up when we start talking about debits and credits. So here is an example of a balance sheet. And the idea here is just to put some names to what you have, what you owe, and what's left over. Um, cash, petty cash, investments, receivables, inventory, supplies, uh, prepaid expenses. Okay, this is a really interesting concept. And this also goes to the matching principle. So I made it a point to include these concepts here as we talk about stuff. But with a prepaid expense, when I buy an insurance policy for the year, let's say I buy a $12,000 insurance policy. I don't wanna, and I buy it in the month of January. I don't wanna book $12,000 of insurance expense in January, right? I want to spread that out because I want to match. I want to match that expense with that year's worth of revenue because that was a part of what, what went with it. That's what's called a prepaid expense. So I book, when I buy that policy, I book it to my balance sheet as a current asset and I amortize it over 12 months. So amortize, and we'll talk about amortization in a little bit, but we're talking about it now, but it's actually on one of the upcoming slides. But the idea is to spread the cost of that insurance policy equally over the period of time that we're gonna use it. So this is where y'all need to slow me down if you wanna ask a question, because uh, I really would, I'm more interested in you getting it than I am of getting through this material and, and then having half of y'all leave and not understanding something. Okay. Okay. It, because it is something that you have and you haven't used it yet. So if you cancel that, if you pay $12,000 for an insurance policy today and next month you cancel it, unless, unless there's a minimum earned, which there usually is some sort of minimum earned, but you get a refund. So it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's something that you have purchased that you haven't used up yet. So it's an asset because it's something that you have. Who else had a question? Oh, the question on that one was, uh, how do we know that prepaid insurance is an asset? Sorry. Well, so to, to go back to that question, is if I'm paying it monthly, then it's not in the asset column? This great question. You said if I'm paying it monthly. So it's very common. So the question was, if I'm paying it monthly, is it not in the asset column? If you're paying it monthly, this is very, very common, and it's something that businesses do wrong all day long. Very common to uh, finance insurance, right? $12,000 policy, I pay $2,000 down, and I pay the rest of it out over 10 months, right? right. And what, is, what do most businesses do when they write the check for that insurance note? Okay. They code it to insurance expense. And what happens two months out of the year? are not matched properly because, because the reason is we didn't separate what we have from what we owe. So if you finance insurance, when you buy insurance, if you finance it, the, po the amortization of the policy is the expense that hits equally. The financed amount is a liability. 
and there's a principal and an interest component just like there would be on a car note or on a truck note. So does that answer your question? I mean, it does, and it could lead to a bunch of other questions, but I'll let you Wonderful. I love questions. And like I said, if we don't get every, through everything, that's great, but if we do, great. So, um, and I actually give a, uh, an accounting aptitude test to people when they come to work for us. That's number 16 on the test. It's very basic, because really everything you need to know about accounting in a small business, they taught in an intro to financial accounting, in, in small business. Um, or 90% of it anyway. So that question though is number 16 on our accounting test. So that's a, I'm glad you asked it because I was about to talk about it next. So uh, prepaid expenses are something that you have. So that, that liability side of the insurance would be a note payable, right? It's really just a loan. Now some insurance companies, I have a client, and these are all different, they're not all the same. I have a client that has State Farm and they pay no interest and they pay 12 equal monthly payments all year. We're not gonna go through all this. We're just gonna code that to insurance expense because it's, it's matched properly, right? Going back to our, um, to our principles and, and that's just the way we would do it. Um, all right, so what we have, what we owe, what's left over, I um, want to talk about what's left over down here. Now this balance sheet and something that you see in all of the accounting textbooks is you see this equity account called common stock or treasury stock. Truth be told, the majority of small businesses don't have that. Uh, if you're a sub S corporation or a C corp, you would have stock because you actually sell stock. But if it's an LLC and it's owned by uh, a sole proprietor, you're going to have owner contributions and owner draws, or you may have an owner equity and owner draws. Uh, that's typically what you see in a small business, not, not what's here on this stock example that I pulled off of the interwebs. Um, now, some, one other thing I want to touch on while I'm here is uh, Goodwill. Um, this is something that's interesting on the balance sheet. Some of you may have bought your businesses from other people. Um, Goodwill is an it is on the books as an asset and Goodwill is the amount above and beyond the market value of the receivables and the equipment and all the things that you can put a dollar value on that you paid for the company. So uh, if you looked at Next Level Solutions and I'm just going to dream for a minute and we were worth five million dollars on paper which we're not anywhere near that but if we were worth a bunch of money um, if you looked at our assets and our, the money we had in the bank and the receivables and all of that, but you were buying it for 10 million, then the, the purchaser of that, when they set up their new set of books, they would have $5 million of goodwill on their books. Um, does that make sense? Questions? Okay. So on the income statement, this is the one everybody likes to look at right? Small business owners. I love to look at the income statement. Did I make any money? But what they really don't realize is that if the balance sheet's not accurate, the income statement's not accurate. So that's when people make decisions based off of this a lot of times. Uh, the income statement covers a period of time. It shows you what you build your customers. It shows you what you spent on direct costs or cost of goods sold is a synonym for direct costs. We're going to talk about that in a second and what you spend on overhead or fixed expenses. Those are synonyms for each other. You will notice on some, uh, some income statements or P&Ls, there's a section at the end of, oper of operating expenses that says other income or other expenses. Those would be um, income and expenses that are outside of the normal operations of the business. So give you an example, in our building, we lease part of our building to a client of ours. So when I show rent income on my P&L, it's other income. It's not part of my normal revenues because I don't want to look, I want to I want to look at how the company's do and I don't want to count things that really aren't a part of what we do um, through our normal operations. Any questions on that? So when you talk about sharing, <coughs> 
Good question. So uh, discretion, he, the question is, does discretionary spending fall into this category? Uh, it depends on the nature of the discretionary spending. Usually, uh, usually what I see is that people will expense travel, uh, like their business, it's normal to have for the business to have travel expense, and then somebody might, you know, expense travel. Well, in that case, it would not be uh, normal. But uh, if they, uh, and, and normally uh, the way to track that is through, not so much through the chart of accounts, okay? So when we look at an income statement, we have the chart of accounts on the, the left-hand side, right? Office supplies, revenue, and all of that. The typical way we would track those type of expenses is to create classes or tags or departments or some other kind of way to where we could use the same general ledger accounts, but then we have columns that break out these other types of expenses. Does that make sense? So here's an example, uh, so to, as part of your question, so like if we, in this case, we might have up here normal operations, and then we may have another column called owner discretionary, right? That we could use these same accounts, but have different, um, different departments or categories that, that they would call, they would all, you could run a report like this that they would all roll up, which is usually what they do a tax return based off of. Um, or, you know, or you could, if you want to look at it from a management perspective, that's when you would break it out. Or if you were trying to show a potential acquirer hey, this is what our company normally operates like. So, uh, so on the income statement, everybody knows what revenue is because that's the first thing every small business owner learns is selling stuff and collecting money. That's the fun number. How much can we sell? So uh, cost of goods sold is, or, or direct costs, are expenses that are generated when you sell something. They're specifically tied to a sale. And it's important to separate these if you really wanna get, if you wanna use this data to create pricing tools and to give you information to make better decisions with, you wanna be able to separate out the expenses that are related to sales versus expenses that are there no matter what. So, uh, Alyssa, for example, your business, she's in the, she has a stationary business. It's Paper White Boutique over um, by Burgersmith on Highland. They sell stationary. The expense of the paper and the stuff that they buy when they sell it, that's cost of goods sold. Um, now, you want to match properly so we don't want to put all stuff that we bought in cost of goods sold because sometimes we have to hold inventory, which is an asset, right? Something we have. Sometimes we have to hold inventory and it only, it only hits cost of goods when we use it. And this, is, this is an area of struggle for just about any small business that has any kind of inventory is tracking inventory. And, and then when do we apply the materiality principle to how much time is it really worth to track it? If you got $5,000 worth of inventory and, and it's a million dollar a year business, is it, are we gonna use the materiality card and say, eh, it's just not material. I'm just gonna expense it all. But so, um, so anyway, a couple of different concepts there. But cost of goods is when it's actually, remember it's when it's actually used because it's matched properly, yes? Good question. Is, the, is cost of goods sold the landed cost or do you break it out? So, um, and really, really, the, the, I'm going to change your question a little bit and say is, is the inventory cost landed because that eventually becomes cost of goods, okay? And yes, the cost of acquiring, preparing, shipping, getting that item into inventory to be ready to sell it is part of that cost, that cost of that item, okay? So then when you sell it, yes, it becomes part of cost of goods sold. Does that make sense? So would you rather expense that freight expense so you don't uh, so you decrease your inventory valuation? Well, what, what I would do 
is I would want to include if, well, first of all, is it material? So let's say it's material. Let's say it came on a container from China and freight was $20,000. That's material in most small businesses. I would want to match that cost as I used up that inventory. So it, that, that cost of that freight is a part of the cost of that inventory until you use it and then it gets expensed. And the reason I would do that is because I would follow the matching principle. So we have to make a decision as, so the question is for ad valorem tax, which if, if you don't know what ad valorem tax, it's inventory tax. So when you buy stuff and you pay sales tax, that's not good enough. When you pay income tax on your profits, that's not good enough. All of the furniture and equipment and supplies that you own in your business, you pay tax on every year. And so you have to make a decision, or am I more interested in building the value in my company and being able to demonstrate that through accurate financials? Or am I more interested in taking the biggest deduction that I can so I pay fewer taxes? So that's kind of the trade-off. So yes, to answer your question, you bring it into the cost of inventory, cost of inventory is higher, you pay, you're paying property taxes on that. So that's just a decision you have to make. I've made the decision that I feel like I'm stepping over, um, I feel like I'm stepping over dollars to pick up pennies when I do that because when I have a real true picture of what I'm doing and I know, I know to a, a science where everything is that I'm going to gain more from that than I am not paying my four mills or property tax or whatever it is, you know. Uh, but that's a real good question. You're, that's, that's the... That's the struggle that every small business owner has. They don't want to pay taxes. And I don't want to get bogged down on the subject, but I, mean, I think it's pretty important. So I'm just trying to understand a little bit more. So just use an example. If it costs, just say, $20 to ship the stationery to her business, I'm going to push that cost to the product and to the consumer. So isn't the value of that stationery, isn't that freight cost then included in that inventory? That's, so the question is, does the, is the freight cost included in the inventory whenever something is shipped in? And the answer is yes. That's, that, and that's, that's not me standing up. That is, actually, that, that is part of generally accepted accounting, gap accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. No, it is, and that was the answer that I gave Chris, but what Chris's point was, was when I do that, I'm inflating my inventory cost, which makes me have to pay this other tax, makes me pay more of this other tax. So that was his point, and it's a valid point, and it's, it's the, it's the trade-off. So, and then, you know, my, my opinion is that it's more important to have accurate numbers for the reasons I explained at the beginning than it is to, to try to, um, you know, if you want to, if you, if you want to save money on taxes, use this discretionary thing I'm talking about, but I didn't tell you to do it even though it's filmed and <laughs> going to be on the interwebs. So, because it is not, uh, that is not the way you're supposed to do it. All right. So this is a really cool analogy. I have a background in transportation, so I think of things like trucks and things like that. So when we're talking about financial, the, this financial picture and managing a business, I kind of like to think about it like, like a ride in a, in a truck or a car. And there are three components here. One of them is the rear view mirror, which tells me what just happened. That's, my, th that's when I get to a point where I can produce accurate and timely financials every month. I'm able to tell you what just happened pretty regularly. Most small business owners cannot tell you that. That is the reality of it. Most of them can't. They think they can, but they're not accurate. The next thing is what's happening now, which is the dashboard. So once we, once we have established our foundation and we know what's happened in the past, we can then begin to build tools off of that data and the collection of that data 
that helps us look at key indicators. So like in our business, we're a professional services firm. So everybody's time is our inventory. So I'm looking at, on a weekly basis, I'm looking at how much of our time was unbillable. You know, I, I know that that is a metric that's gonna drive profitability. Uh, where, you know, where are my sales month to date? That's a very simple metric that just about anybody can give you. Uh, there are lots of different examples in the trucking business. What's my miles per gallon? What's my physical damage cost? Um, every, um, in the restaurant business, my food waste, right? These are things that if you manage them to a number, you, uh, you're, you're gonna, your actions throughout the period are going to impact your profitability positively. And then finally, what's going to happen? The windshield. So a lot of people say, oh, I got to have a budget. I need to plan. I need to do some future planning. In my opinion, when you do this, and I'm an expert on my opinion, by the way, so <laughs> it's, it is my opinion only. But my opinion is that if you go out and you focus on this before you know this stuff, it's kind of like building a house and deciding to put up, uh, put the carpet in before you put up the sheetrock and blow texture and paint. You know, it's, it's, you can do it, you're just kind of doing it in the wrong order. It's, it's better to do it the other way. So any questions? This is where it's about to get ticky tacky. This is where, it, nobody's asleep yet. This is fantastic. Are y'all okay? Nobody's left, nobody fell asleep. I see a couple of you dozing, but all right. So in accounting, did I just see somebody leave? No, okay, sorry. In, uh, in accounting, <laughs> in accounting, every transaction is at least dual entry. So that means there is a debit and a credit. So for everything you do, there is a, there is a corresponding action to that. Um, that's why in accounting, we can't just make stuff up. Well, just put some more sales in there. Well, I can credit the revenue, but what do you want me to debit? You know, my choices are I can debit expenses or I can debit an asset, and then I've got something there that doesn't exist. If I credit expenses, I'm really stupid because I've, I've made zero impact on my income statement. Uh, if I debit assets, I'm saying I own something that I don't own, right? Because I've, I've added a debit there. Um, so every transaction is at least dual entry, and the reason for that is it's to keep us honest. I mean, that's really why it's there. It's, it's to make it to where you just can't hide. It's just very hard to hide stuff in accounting. Whoever came up with this stuff is a genius because I, I, I still don't know who, who invented all of this. But so, um, so who in this room actually works with debits and credits or has any, you do? Okay, so you have rental, but, but you, have a, so you have a set of books, you're doing transactions, you see journal entries, and is there, is there anybody else in here who interacts with that kind of stuff? You do? Okay. So we all do. Who, who, who knows debits and credits like you know this stuff already? Okay, good. That's good. Then y'all are going to like this part. Okay. So she knows how to balance the checkbook. So the first thing that we want to talk about is I'm going to give you some cheaters, okay? If you, if you remember this stuff that you're, that you don't even have to write it down because you can just look at the answers, but if you remember what I'm about to show you, journal entries will make sense to you from now until the end of time. You have to remember just a few things. And what I find is that when, so when you apply these principles, that's the trick is you got to remember them and you got to make the leap from knowing them to being able to apply them. When you apply these principles and, and you remember what I'm about to show you, a journal entry is as simple as fill, if it's complex, fill in the pieces that you know by applying the principles and these cheat little cheaters I'm about to give you. And then, then it's usually pretty easy to figure out what you're missing. And, and that's how, I passed accounting in college. Um, 
I actually made really good grades in accounting, but that's why like, I got it because I was like, okay, this is just a puzzle. If it's, and some of the more complex journal entries are, we had a car, we traded it in and we bought another car and we bought a warranty and we financed it with two different uh, financing companies. That's pretty complex journal entry. You, you do this stuff and it'll make it easier. So here's what you need to remember. Whoops. Debits increase assets, cost of goods sold, and expenses. So if you remember that debits increase these, what do credits do to them? Decrease. They decrease them, right? So I'm not asking you to remember it all. I just want you to remember half of it. Debits increase assets, cost of goods, and expenses. Liabilities or credits increase liabilities, equity, and revenue. Now, if you notice, if you remember what I was talking about earlier about being confused about how a debit increased an asset and it confused me why a revenue was a credit, credits increase liabilities and equity and revenue because they're all on that side of the balance sheet, right? It does seem like it's backwards. It, it seems like it's backwards, but, but it's not because if you remember liabilities, remember the balance sheet, assets equals liabilities and plus equity. What I have equals what I, what I owe and what's left. What I owe and what's left are together. So if I increase what I have left and I increase what I owe, they're the same thing, right? They're on the same side of the equation. One's good and one's bad, but uh, liability, so credits increase liabilities, equity, and revenue. And the reason for that is that P&L is an expansion of the equity section of the balance sheet. It's what's left over. It's how I create what's left over. Now, Carrie, you are not an accounting person. How am I doing? Are you getting any of this? So, you, so what you're telling me is you still, I'm still... You're still not getting it. Well, why aren't you asking questions? I need a picture. Yeah. I need an illustration. Yeah. Who, who's not? Well, let's work on this then. Let's work on this. I mean, I'm fine with everything but revenue. Credits increase revenue. Okay, good. This, we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. So I'm going to go backwards in the presentation. So bear with me a second because this is important. Okay. Remember our balance sheet. You wanted a picture, I'm giving you a picture. We have what we have, what we owe, and what's left over, okay? This is the bad stuff on this side of the equation, and this is the good stuff. The more of this that we have helps offset the bad that we have. But they're on the same side of the equation because because the assets are the, that, that's the big part, right? Hopefully, that's the big part. Liabilities hopefully are less than our assets and then we have money left over. So because these are on that side of the balance sheet, that's why, you know, that's why there's bad and good together. So that's thing number one. Thing number two, you see this retained earnings line? All that retained earnings means, it is the cumulative effect of all of your income statement items. Okay, so on the income statement, so if I, if I were to increase this equity, what do I do? I credit it, right? If I'm on my income statement and I want to increase my bottom line, what do I add? More revenue. What do, I what do I do to increase my revenue? I credit it. That's why you credit revenue. Does that make sense? Okay. Anybody else who didn't get it? I'm going to go over it again. Nope. If you got it, free drinks after this. Okay, so let me get through all of these now. So, so, that, so when I said earlier that that income statement is just an expansion of the equity section, I was talking like a college professor, and that made no sense until we actually looked at it. That's what I meant when I said that, is that that retained earnings line, that's part of your equity section. All that is is the result of all your P&Ls. You know, it's just showing you how all that works. So 
if you remember debits increase assets, cost of goods, and expenses, and credits increase liabilities, equity, and revenue, you have half you, you, you've got half of, of what it is to do a journal entry. So when you're making journal entries, if you use the principles and you use this, and I wish I, I, should give, I wish I could give us, I should have done an example problem. The insurance one is a great one. But, um, okay, so anyway, I'm going to move on. If you have a question, stop me. Now, here's one we were talking about before. <coughs> Carrie said, I don't understand, I still don't understand why the bank is different. When I go to the bank and they, who, who's ever had that? You have a debit card, but when you swipe your debit card, what does it do? It takes money out of your bank account, right? So, but I just told you that debits increase assets and your bank account is an asset. So doesn't that, isn't that confusing? Yes. Who knows why? Somebody in here knows why, so I don't have to tell you. Do you know why? No? Who knows why? The bank. That's right. My bank account to the bank is not an asset. So accounting is done from the perspective of the entity, right? Done from the perspective of the entity doing the transaction that when, when I go to the bank and I debit that account, I've just reduced one of their liabilities, not, not increased one of their assets. So if credits increase liabilities and I go to the bank and my bank account is a liability for them and I use my debit card, what did I do? I decreased their liability to me, so I debited my account there. Then if I use my credit card, then I increase my liability to the credit card. If you use your credit card, you increase your liability because that is, that's exactly right. That's why it's called a credit card. Now what's interesting is a credit card company, they should technically call that a debit card because you're increasing their asset, yeah. right? Right, yeah. right, but they're tricky. There's a reason they spend billions of dollars studying your behavior. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's interesting, isn't it? When you start, when it starts clicking like that. Okay. What's your name again? Parker. No, not you, this gentleman. Monty. What's that? Monty. Monty. You asked a question earlier about fixed assets. We're getting ready to talk about that. Barker asked a lot of questions too, but not about fixed assets. You gotta use the laser. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, so fixed assets. So, so first of all, what is a fixed asset? It's something that I have, right? So it's an asset, and it is, it is typically something that we're gonna spread over a long period of time. So if you own rental properties, your, your properties that you acquire, you know, you've got building and land, and those are fixed assets for you. If you buy insurance for the year, that's not a fixed asset, that's a current asset, but we're not getting that deep into all this, it's, it's an asset. Depreciation is spreading the cost of an asset over time. So, uh, so the example of, and when we do this, we are, uh, we're doing it for two reasons. We're either doing it for tax purposes or we're doing it for managing our, our business, okay? And we're, we're gonna talk about tax versus book in a second. But when we're doing it for our business, we are matching the use of that vehicle the expense of the use of that vehicle over the period of time that we're going to actually use it. So if we buy a $50,000 truck and uh, we're going to use it for, you know, seven years and we think it's going to be worth five grand at the end of seven years, we are going to dip, we're going to set a residual value of five grand, but we're going to, we're going to evenly spread $45,000 over seven years. So at the end of seven years, that truck is on our books for the residual value for five grand. Now, so that, that is, that's, and I'm, I keep wanting to jump to tax, but I'm gonna hold off on that. So that is depreciate, that is called straight line depreciation. That's what I would encourage you to do 
for, for the purposes of managing your business and properly matching revenue with expenses. Amortization is the exact same concept, but it's for an intangible asset, such as prepaid insurance, like we talked about. We bought the insurance policy. That's not a fixed asset. It's, it's really intangible, right? It's a bucket of dollars. It's something that we bought, so it's called amortization. It's really the same thing. It's the same concept. We want to spread that, we want to spread that over a period of time. An example of, an intang of a common intangible asset in business, small businesses, is leasehold improvements. <laughs> so um, you, buy a, you, you get into a lease and you do a bunch of work to it and you're paying your lease payment, but part of that might have been included in your lease, part of it might have come out of your pocket. Well, that's not, you can expense all that if you want, and once again, this goes back to the, ta the cash basis versus accrual. You can do your taxes on a cash basis if you want. You can expense it all, or what you should do though properly if you want to really know how your business is performing is you want to book that as a prepaid, you know, as a fixed asset and you want to amortize it. So if you spent $20,000 in leasehold improvements, I don't want to show that I lost that 20 grand in year one. I want to look at my books and know that those leasehold improvements are going to go over, if my lease is five years, then I'm going to spread it over five years. Now, if I release the building after that, I'm not doing anything with it. It's fully amortized, but at the time that I, that I make the decision to amortize it, my lease is only five years. That's the information I have. That's the amount of time I would spread it over. Any questions on that? So large purchases so this is kind of what we're talking about with these leasehold improvements is that that is a large purchase if if you want to really know how your business is operating when you go spend um when you go spend ten thousand dollars on furniture or on a vehicle you don't want to expense that right away it's the same concept you want to capitalize it so large purchases get capitalized which basically means it get, it becomes a fixed asset and it, it's, a, it's something that you depreciate. And you will apply the materiality principle and create a materiality threshold of for my business, what is a material thing to expense? And when I say expense, it means it hits your P&L. It shows that that's a, that's a hit on your production and your performance. Or do I capitalize it, meaning I still show the profit and I trickle the expense over time. You make a decision on that. Now, in our business, when we started it, there were three partners and we had a valuation formula that, um, that we track every month based off of our performance. So I, I cap, if I truly buy something in my business, if I buy an $800 computer, I don't want to devalue my company because if something happens and we exercise that valuation formula, I capitalize that. I will take an $850 computer at Next Level Solutions and I will depreciate it over three years because I don't want to devalue my company. I want, and, and so I'm forced to make that decision when I choose to expense or capitalize because it has a real impact on the value of my company to my business partner. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense. That maybe helps tie back into that when we, when we did the why slide is financial statements or how you, you build value. Um, maybe that helps tie some of that together. So now here's, a, here's another uh, example about this. I, I said we were going to talk about tax versus book depreciation. So we've all listened to uh, politics on the news and this tax bill got passed and George Bush had the bonus depreciation. Do y'all remember all this from the bonus. bonus depreciation? Everybody loves bonus depreciation. Why? It's designed to stimulate the economy because it gives you a way to, um, to reduce your taxable income as a business owner so you can take that money and invest it back in the company that year. So 
there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking advantage of those and we want to take advantage of all the bonus depreciation and all of the section 179 that's another um, section in the IRS code that that says that certain size businesses can write off 100 percent of an asset in a given year uh, we want you to take advantage of all that but what I see happen all the time is your accountant is giving you journal entries to make at the end of the year to match your depreciation to their depreciation okay they are um, and they're, they're not doing anything wrong, but they're also not doing you any favors from a, manage, from a managerial perspective. Because if I buy an $80,000 piece of machinery this year and write it all off, I don't want to look at my financials and think I lost $80,000 more than I really did. I want to take, I want to say back like with the truck, I want to capitalize that. I want to make it a fixed asset and I want to say, how long am I really going to use that for? 20 years? Because I want to spread it over the 20 years because that's truly how I'm going to tell if I'm really making money or not with my investment in my business. Now, it doesn't do me any favors from a cash flow perspective because if I wrote a check and I paid cash for that, then I'm looking at my P&L that says I made all this money, but the money's not in the bank, okay? And that, that's really back to this going concern. We have to understand what the financial statements are there for and that they're just tools. You know, if you ran a statement of cash flows, it would show you that that's where $80,000 of your cash went because that asset, that fixed asset increased, which decreased cash. So you, you just have to understand how these things work. So I'm, I'm not telling you to go out and buy it and borrow money on it. You might, you know, some of you might do that. I'm an anti-debt freak. I don't, I don't like debt. I like to pay cash for stuff, but I have to realize that when I do pay cash for it, that it reduces my cash position now. It puts me in a better position in the future, right? But it hurts my position now. So any questions on, on fixed assets? We have about 10 minutes left. This time is going good here. It's perfect start time. I, and I really had no idea how long this was going to take because of the, so this is good. We're going we're to finish up right on time. Okay. So if you are, how many of you are sitting there thinking to yourself, I got work to do. I got, I got work to do with my books. I, I you know, let, well, let's just assume that I've inspired you, that you're going to do something different, okay? Maybe I did or maybe I didn't. But let's assume that I did. How many of you have work to do at home with your books? I see some heads nodding. Can I, is anybody going to raise their hand? Okay, Chris, good, yeah. So, um, so the, reason, the reason I asked that question is because I want to give you the process to go through if you if you have made that decision that, okay, I really, you know, I really want to do this. I need some kind of order. Like, what do I do first? Because this is a lot of information. So, the, this, and this is exactly the process that we follow when we work with a client, when we go into a new client. This is exactly the process that we follow. And this picture, this black square, it may as well be a picture of a rear view mirror because that's exactly what it is. This is the, these are the steps to knowing what just happened on a regular basis. These are not the steps to developing dashboards or budgeting or strategic planning. These are the steps to the basics. So the first thing is, and there's a, a copy of this in your uh, handout, the first step is government compliance. And when I say government compliance, it means a lot of things. It means a lot of things for different businesses. I was meeting with a security company yesterday. They have certain requirements with licensing of security guards. It could mean uh, sales tax compliance. It could mean I'm a small business owner and all of my income is passed through to my personal tax return and I want to make sure I have enough money at the end of the year to pay my tax return and not owe the IRS a bunch of money. It could mean I haven't paid my payroll taxes in 90 days and I'm using that money to survive, um, which is a really scary place to be in, by the way. So government compliance, that's really the first thing you got to focus on is getting, 
getting to where um, you're stabilizing your situation because when you're out of compliance with what the government requires of you, you're putting yourself, at ex you and your employees at extreme risk because things can happen you have no control over. The second thing is that entity principle or the entity concept, separating personal and business and really, and we've talked about that already, so I, I'm not gonna go through that again, um, but really, really keeping an eye on that. The third thing that we do in our accounting system, whatever that may be, is we, we, we wanna go in and make sure that all of our spending accounts are reconciled. So when I say spending accounts, I'm talking about checking accounts, credit cards, vendor payables, lines of credit, things that we, use, that we get statements on. Now, the reason we do this, and we do this first, is because that, that is what tells us when we follow these first three steps and we know that only business is running through here, when we reconcile these, every bit of the data is in our accounting system. So we, we know we've at least captured it. It's, it's probably in the wrong place and it's not coded right and things are wrong and things aren't following the right principles, but they're at least in the system. The, the next thing that we do after that is we run that balance sheet, that snapshot in time. Remember I said that if the balance sheet's not accurate, the income statement's not accurate. So we go through that balance sheet and it's just as simple as looking at every single thing on there. Is that bank account right? Is that bank balance right? Or is that really my true accounts receivable? Do I have any old stuff on my aging that needs to be cleaned up? Do I, are my payables correct? Are my credit card balances right if I have credit cards? Uh, are my vendor accounts accurate? All of this stuff on the balance sheet. So what that does is as, a, as of a given point in time, if we know that's accurate, then every bit of the, the drama and the trouble is on your income statement at that point. So you go through, you, you start determining what are my true direct expenses, my cost of goods sold, my fixed expenses, and you begin to tweak the way these are organized, and then that puts you in a position to do regular month-end closing. So in closing, I want you to realize that in business, I had to learn this the hard way, that different people have different opinions. And so to say that, oh, I have a bookkeeper and a CPA, that guide me that is that is an incomplete picture that that everybody has different pictures i love cpas we have two of them on our team people but most of them have never run a business most of them not all of them there are a lot of cpas in business but other than their practice you know the the typical track is you get your cpa certification you go to work for a firm you know, you work under another CPA, you do taxes, you do, you know, you begin, you begin this, this uh, life from the perspective of the firm, which is, which is a, you got to have that perspective. It's very important, but you can't only have that. And for some of the reasons we've discussed with the, you know, the tax depreciation, like if you, you got to manage your business, so you need other perspectives. Um, they give great advice, but it's not always practical business advice. Uh, you can't always just ask your business attorney, no offense, but, but they're going to come at you from a legal perspective. You know, I mean, you're an attorney, right? You're, or you passed the bar. Well, I'm assuming you passed. Okay. But, but would you agree with that statement that you have a, you have a, a limited, you know, you've got a wonderful perspective and you know lots of stuff that I don't know that I have to call on you for your expertise, but... Yeah. That's right. They stay in their lane. They, they do, they do, uh, they are exposed to what they are exposed to. The knowledge I've gained, I've gained over the things that I've been exposed to. I call uh, the CPAs on our team. I'll sit down and I'll say, hey, what do you, you know, from an ethical perspective, what is, what's your opinion on this? Or how do you, like, I value that because they have, 
you know, they've got the CPUs, they got a, the, the, or the continuing education credits. Um, I don't even, the CPUs, what am I saying? That's a computer part, isn't it? Uh, C, what it CEU, continuing education units. Um, so they have to keep up with all of that. So they're, they're gonna be uh, more up to date on certain things, but it's just a different perspective. This is one of the most important positions in your life, and that is a trusted advisor. These can be friends, these can be people in business that you admire, uh, they can be professionals. They are, um, you know, and, I, and I, I disclosed to you at the beginning of this that I have a ministry background. The Bible talks about there being wisdom in the counsel of many. And um, this is, you know, that's kind of what this is geared toward is to, to have you, I'm, I'm trying to have you build a team of people around you that, that you can go to when you have serious decisions to make. And even if that meeting costs you $500, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And then finally, I said it during the presentation, if you think it's expensive hiring a professional, wait until you hire an amateur. So um, that is the end of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, and while, while we're doing this, Carrie, I would really, really, really appreciate your feedback on these valuation, evaluation forms. Look, listen to me, I said valuation. I'm, I'm, you can tell where my head is. Um, I would really appreciate your feedback on these forms. I will say this, if, um, if you are interested in, if you have more questions or something you don't understand and you are interested in a follow-up like a webinar or even uh, some kind of additional meeting down at the very bottom, just write webinar, um, I would also, ask you all if you are interested in receiving we do a newsletter once a month where we try to produce good content like this will be part of what goes out in our newsletter uh, Carrie is our HR professional so put your company name um, name and email address if you would like to receive a copy of our newsletter and what am I leaving out anything any questions yes sir Yeah, so the question was about a reference that I made to QuickBooks earlier in the presentation. And yeah, it certainly wasn't a dig because most small businesses are using QuickBooks. Uh, we have several clients that use QuickBooks Desktop, QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Contractor. Um, I don't have an issue with QuickBooks at all. I love, I've been using it for 25 years, so it's, it's one that I know the best. That's probably why I mentioned it. Um, there are, we've got clients that use Sage or, you know, the old peach tree. Uh, we've got clients that are in, um, that are in different, different, uh, custom industry specific solutions. Uh, we've got clients that are, you know, on different web platforms. So, I mean, there are all kinds of, um, there are all kinds of systems. So whatever, you know, whatever that is, what I was referring to was, was just your accounting system assuming you have one. And if you don't, if y'all, if any of you don't have one, hopefully after this, you want to have one because <laughs> you should. And that was primarily because I love the reference power. It's good to have a team of people with maybe different backgrounds that can help you with your decision making. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what you said is Sure. 
Yeah, it's it, there's it's it's just as is you know it's probably one of the most popular solutions, but I no issue with QuickBooks at all, and um, any. Uh, I'm on I'm on several boards as well at the you know the finance committee. Imagine that I'm on the finance committee at my church. Um, but it, but if you need if you have any questions, give me a call. Um, I do have some cards up here. If anybody, my you're welcome to call me um, if you have any questions or need some help. So here I'll give you one of those. There you go. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, so good question. The question was about at the, the bottom of our um, letterhead, it, it has some different areas of business. So, uh, and a lot of that has to do with the way our business has evolved over the years. We used to be a full service IT provider, one of those first partners. But really what, te what uh, so we are an accounting partner. They're, the business or the management part of it is really all kind of wrapped into, you know, just the executive experience or approach. Um, from an HR perspective and from a technology perspective, our, uh, our service that we provide is really about uh, software selection and implementation. So when we go into a, a company that is completely paper-based, helping them find the right solution for, um, you know, for that business and then helping them implement that. One of the, one of the biggest misconceptions about, about purchasing and implementing software is that when I buy the software and I pay the implementation fee, it's implemented. And that's not true. I mean, the majority of the time, there has to be a much larger effort inside the company to, uh, to integrate that system into the culture. And, uh, and also not to just look at their existing business processes and say, how do you do what you do? Let's do it that way in the system. How do you do what you do and why do you do it that way? And what does the system do and what are its capabilities? And how can we modify your processes to make you, you know, so there's this larger, um, there's this larger intentional effort that goes into that. And so that's, that's what we, and so we are unique in that we pair the HR and the accounting and the technology. So we're really kind of like that back office support for small businesses. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay.